running machines. Let's take our Bibles now and turn, if you will, with me to the book of Acts. Looking at a rather exciting passage tonight, a major public riot. And uh, as we look at that, I think uh, perhaps we can learn some things about how to handle the difficult situations that you may find yourself in when you are about to witness or you are witnessing or somebody responds in a negative way to your witness. Tonight the message is entitled, Money and Pagan Gods. Money and Pagan Gods. Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for your word and for its power, for the opportunity that we have day by day to study it. And Father, we thank you for the application that you give to us. In fact, very practical applications directly out of the text. And so, Father, we pray that as we look in the scripture tonight, that you might encourage our hearts, that you might bless us, that you might help us to understand that which you have for us so that we might be able to live for Christ. We've been talking or singing about living for Jesus. What does that really mean? If we're going to live for Jesus, does that include just the things we do or does that include also the things that we say? Do we really just go out there and live a nice Christian life so that everybody thinks we're nice people? Or are we supposed to be communicating something? What does it mean to live for Jesus? Father, we pray for your blessings on this message tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we were looking at part two of casting out demons. Uh, rather significant. That's what immediately precedes our passage for tonight. And in that second half of the message, the first half was two weeks ago, but in the second half of the message, we noted that demonically motivated sexual impurity is seen repeatedly in the Gospels, where Christ cast out what were called unclean demons. And we gave the example of the nudist Gadarene um, demoniac who wore no clothing. And we saw that there was a special word for that in the New Testament. It's the word aselgia, which is translated lasciviousness, and you find that in a number of places, especially in Paul's writings. It means uninhibited shamelessness, and that is one of the marks of demonism. Lasciviousness has crept into the modern American church, and we talked about that, how uh, we see lasciviousness in the clothing styles of girls and women, but also in the body decorations, tattoos, body piercings, and body revealing clothing of boys and men. And uh, we looked at Luke chapter 8, verse 27, and saw that this particular man who was possessed with unclean demons wore no clothing, but after he got saved, in verse 35, it says he was clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Yeah, people who uh, are so used to that, it's a sudden shock to them to see somebody who actually gets converted and whose life has changed. <laughs> Did you know that's what's supposed to happen? That when you trust Christ... Your life is supposed to be changed. You don't just continue on and on and on the way you are. I remember now almost 40 years ago uh, when I was pastoring a church up in North Jersey and uh, there was a family involved in that church that made a profession of faith at a Billy Graham revival and they claimed to be truly saved and they talked like they were saved. But they never came to church. They never showed any interest in the Bible. I called on them a number of occasions, and they said, well, yeah, but Sunday's really our only day off, and what we like to do is on Sunday we all go out uh, and we do dirt biking, and uh, we do that as a family event, and Sunday is the day that we do that. But they had no desire at all. They also had some other things in their life that were rather unclean kind of things that they got involved in. Um, folks, when you trust Christ, if it's real, there will be a change in your life and that's one of the things that we see clearly in that passage there. We saw these unclean demons possess people. They show up in religious settings as well. Um, and that's very clear from Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 27. A man with an unclean spirit that was in the synagogue. And as soon as Jesus came into the synagogue, the demon inside of him screamed out in terror. You know, what have we to do with you, Jesus? You, oh, we know who you are. Oh, don't, don't bother us. And Jesus rebuked him, and when the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed. Everybody was amazed. Now, whether they were amazed at the fact that the guy had an unclean spirit, or they sort of suspected it, but what they were amazed at, really, is it tells you in the verse, it says, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits. And they obey him. I think they were taken by surprise on two counts with that. 
We saw that that type of demonic possession can happen even to young children, possibly through exposure to immoral activities or sexual abuse or the occult or pornography. I know of situations where uh, children have become demon-possessed because their parents were involved in witchcraft and uh, practicing different things, reading horoscopes and uh, doing seances. And uh, Folks, that's not a game. That's very dangerous stuff. And that opens the door for not only you to have incredible demonic attack, but also for children and grandchildren when you get involved in that kind of thing. So stay away from it. God doesn't want you dabbling in that. We've seen a great deal on that. We saw that there was a young girl uh, who had an unclean spirit in Mark chapter 7, the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. We saw that there was a little child, a Pideon, an infant, uh, who had gotten an unclean spirit in Mark chapter 9, verse 21. And Jesus rebuked that unclean spirit, and it came out. And the disciples asked, how come we couldn't do it? They were trying to do it, and they couldn't do it. And Jesus had told them, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And that, of course, is still available for us today. Prayer and fasting. When was the last time you fasted? We don't have the direct authority of the apostles to cast out demons. And even they had a difficult time with this one here. But we do have the authority to pray and to fast. And we ought to be doing that for very special and very specific things. That brought us to the differences. We need to see the contrast between uncleanness in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We saw there were five different things in the Old Testament. Food that the body consumes, that was the dietary laws. There were certain things that were unclean. We saw that waste that comes out of the body was unclean. We saw that defilement by touching a dead body made you unclean. We saw that there were certain diseases like leprosy that uh, made the person who had it unclean. And then, of course, the uncleanness that was applied to sexual matters, which is where the focus is in the New Testament. All those other things are not related to us in the New Testament. You don't get defiled by touching a dead body and then God says you're unclean. That's, that's not a problem in the New Testament. But the moral issues are very important in the New Testament. That's how it is always used when you see uncleanness, except when there's a Jewish argument going on in the book of Acts. But when you see it being used in its doctrinal context, it's always in the context of immorality. And we saw that it focused uh, on things like self-gratification and sodomy and worse uh, in the New Testament when Paul gives his lists in Romans chapter 1. We saw that there were some key details about the counterfeits that help us to understand the sons of Sceva, those guys who were uh, trying to cast out demons in Acts chapter 19. When we looked at Simon the sorcerer and then later we looked at Elymas the sorcerer, there's a lot of um, demonic opposition going on in the book of Acts, and very publicly so. We talked about how it's not quite as public today in the United States. Satan has other ways of getting through. But it is showing in the culture because of the way, and you're familiar with, of course, the Obergefell versus Hodges case that came down from the United States Supreme Court. It is now becoming commonplace, accepted, and I am convinced related to unclean, unclean demonic activity. We talked about sorcery, magia, from which we get magic. We talked about the word bewitched in Acts chapter 8. Existe me, which means to stand outside of. It's like putting somebody outside of their wits. We saw that Simon's not the only sorcerer in the New Testament. There's also Elymas, who tried to keep the Roman proconsul from listening to Paul, and he was smitten with blindness, of course. That was one of Paul's miracles. Definitely not a healing miracle. We saw that in each of these situations where we have the magicians and the sorcerers and the, the exorcists showing up, the three things are always present. Number one, we saw the purpose of God, which was the doctrine of the Lord. There was spiritual warfare for the faith going on. Number two, we saw that there were the purposes of the demons. The demons wanted to possess people and, in the case of unclean demons, make them naked. Third, we saw a connection to money. Very, very important. And, of course, we had that young woman who was demon-possessed that had a spirit of python, a spirit of divination, whom Paul cast the demon out of her. And when her master saw that their hope of gain was gone, that's when they had Paul arrested and thrown into jail, and he was beaten, and they sang hymns in the middle of the night. And <laughs> even through that very, very uncomfortable event, there was a Gentile jailer and his entire family that got saved. Spiritual warfare, folks. You see it going on all the way through the book of Acts. It goes on here today in the United States, although not in quite the same way. Satan adjusts his strategies depending on where he's located because he doesn't want people even to believe in him. <laughs> you know, it's much different than in the jungles of Africa or down in South America in the jungle somewhere where people know there are demons and they fear them. 
But it's quite convenient for the devil here in the United States to have most people not even believe that he exists because that way he's free to move about and do his own thing and deceive them and get them involved in all the things that they're currently involved in and destroy them. And that is what is happening all around us. And then we saw that there is a lot of money to be made with demonic type of activity and many illustrations of that. We talked about sorcery and witchcraft as capital crimes in the Old Testament. We talked about those who were witches were to be put to death by God. Uh, witchcraft was practiced by Jezebel. Sorcery and witchcraft tied to the works of the flesh and adultery in Galatians 5. We saw that rebellion was placed in the same category as witchcraft and connected to idolatry, immorality, and stubbornness. I quoted that passage this morning in the message. We saw that there were soothsayers, fortune tellers, astrologers. The Bible has a lot to say about this. Observers of times, diviners, prognosticators, incantations, augury, and Chaldeans. We saw that the word for uh, the Chaldeans is from the word nachash, to hiss, a serpent. Tells you the source of the information. We saw that there were diviners in divination. We saw that there was drug use. In fact, sorcery is the way it's translated in the book of Revelation, but it's the words pharmakeia, pharmakeus, pharmakon, pharmakos, those are the things we get our word pharmacy from today. Hallucinogenic, psychotropic drugs that alter your mind. Hypnotism, pain medication. You know, the book of Acts talks about things like this, and people are enslaved to it even today without realizing there's demonic activity involved. We saw Paul had a 100% success rate using the aprons or handkerchiefs, and none of the modern day faith healers, the mail order faith healers, if you will, have that kind of a success rate, which makes them false prophets. That brings us to verse 21 tonight. Money and pagan gods. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with workmen of the like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. When then Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not, and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him, that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not whether they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. When they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. 
Luke must have had fun writing that passage. You know, on some things he goes through it pretty quickly. He skips over things. He gives you only a brief synopsis. He gives you a full knockdown and drag out of this uh, event that took place there in Ephesus. Uh, he was there. He was listening in. He was thinking about what was going on. He thought, wow, this was an exciting event in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, six things have just occurred when we get started in this passage tonight. Six things. And you see some rather practical application as you look at those six things. Number one, Paul had just been involved in a very heavy spiritual battle. Number two, he had seen great victory with many people coming to Christ. So there's a sense of euphoria that's going on here. Number three, the devil had been defeated, soundly defeated. Number four, all the demonic resources had been burned. All those books had just gotten burned up. Does this sound like a, a victorious, wonderful time for celebration? I would think so. Number five, Christians had repented and confessed their sins. Some of the Christians had been messing around with this stuff. That's what the text says. And number six, the gospel was spreading over the entire region that was controlled by Ephesus. Now, you know, if you'd just been through something like that, it would be really great. You'd really feel good about it. In fact, some of the things Paul does here in this passage demonstrates that he, he felt pretty confident about what was going on in Ephesus. He wasn't quite prepared for the devil's second punch. Remember that. When you've had spiritual victory in your life, the devil is going to come back pretty quickly with a second punch. We've talked about that somewhat in detail in earlier chapters in the book of Acts. He doesn't take no for an answer. He comes back with a second blow. He comes back with a left hook after he's given the right jab. And you've turned to the side. Remember that. That's what's going on here in the passage. Paul felt like he, apparently from this passage, verse 21, felt like he needed a little R&R, &R, a little rest and relaxation. He was a long way from home. He still had to travel through Macedonia and Achaia, but he planned to go back to home base, which was Jerusalem. Verse 21, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. But notice something very important in the passage. Paul didn't look at Jerusalem as the end of the journey. Did you pick that up? He wanted to go back to Jerusalem. That's home base. Jerusalem is where the apostles were. That's where he would give his missionary report. He knew he had a long trip to get there. He had to go through Macedonia and Achaia. But he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. A place of recharging the battery, so to speak. And then he said, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. You know, that teaches us several very important things. He was already making plans for his next missionary assignment. It wasn't the end of the journey for him. He was making plans for the next point of service. When you get something accomplished, do you immediately think, now what is it that God wants me to do next? Most of us just sort of flop back. <laughs> I know this is, the, this is the feeling like at the end of vacation Bible school. Praise the Lord, it is over. How many of you all want to say amen to that? You're laughing out there. <laughs> yeah, you know you are glad. I mean, it's been a lot of work. Was it, was it a lot of work to put that together? Yeah, I know it was. You're sitting back there nodding and grinning. I know it was. I saw you guys working. You did a tremendous job. Fantastic decorations. Everybody slaved late at night. I mean, some of you guys stayed over in the school building overnight just so you'd be there early in the morning. And you did a, a great job. And I thank you for that. And I think that the young people, the children who came, had a, had a blast and they also heard the Word of God. That's important. Very important. Don't just think, okay, maybe next year. What's the very next thing that God wants you to do? Paul already had it in mind. After I've gotten to Jerusalem, he says, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. That takes us to what I think are eight very important lessons that we can get out of just that one verse there. Number one, it is important to take some time to recharge spiritually. Just make sure you don't get into lazy habits while you're doing it. Number two, 
remember this one, there may be things that happen before you can get your battery recharged. That's what happened with Paul here. He didn't, I mean, he was still in Ephesus. He had sent some other guys out. You know, he had sent Timotheus, Timothy, and Aristarchus out on another trip, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But he was still there when he got hit with this mass riot. There may be things that happen before you can get your batteries recharged. The third thing I think that we learn out of this passage is the devil will not be happy when you win a battle and he will come right back at you but with different tactics. In this case, it wasn't a bunch of hooligans who were trying to cast out demons. Instead, it was a guy who made silver shrines to Diana. You know, we, we switched all of a sudden from Company A to Company B coming at us. We switched from having the Marines attacking us to having the Air Force attacking us. That's what's going on here. In other words, be ready because there's always a follow-up attack. Number four, God gives the necessary resources when an interruption breaks into our plans. And here we see uh, at least three different necessary resources that God gave. We see the first was his friends. His other disciples said they... they they really sort of held him back. Paul was, hey, another fight. Let's get into it. You know, he, was, he was ready to go in there swinging his fists. You know, Paul the bulldog. Remember we talked about that? When he got stoned, what did he do? Did he walk away from the city and say, man, I'm not going to go back to that place? No, he got up and the first thing he did was he walked into the city where the people were who had just stoned him. <laughs> I think the disciples knew that was Paul's character. But here in this case, they managed to restrain him. In fact, we find a second resource that came to his aid here, and that is there were friends of his who were in high positions of authority there in the city. And they sent a messenger to him that said, Paul, Paul, do not go in there. There are thousands of people, and they're, they're looking for blood. You know, you don't need to do this. Now, you know, that's kind of wise, what they said, because most of the people did not know why they were there. They just thought, hey, there's a riot going on. Let's participate. Hey, there's something going on. There's a big parade. Or, you know, you hear the, the sirens going. You see the lights flashing. And what does everybody do? They rubberneck. You're driving down the road and suddenly traffic slows down. And you think, what in the matter is ahead? Well, you get a little farther and there's a big wreck. A big 18-wheeler has turned over. And, I mean, nothing's blocking the road. The people could have zipped on by. But what are they doing? They're rubbernecking, aren't they? <laughs> That's what's going on here. I mean, there's this huge group of people that have no idea why they have come in. Demetrius and the silversmiths know. And, you know, they're, they're talking about this greatest dying of the Ephesians. And, you know, we, we sure don't like the fact that people are standing against dying of the Ephesians because, after all, that's our religion here and everybody worships Diana. And people say, yeah, yeah, that's true. But what, what's going on? What's going on? It tells us the people were confused. They had no idea what was going on. The third resource that God gave to him was somebody who wasn't his friend, but who just wanted to have peace and order in the town. And that's the town clerk. So God sent along three different groups or individuals who intervened in the situation so that in the end, God is glorified. And in the end, Paul was protected. Fascinating to look at that. God is quite able to give the necessary resources when an interruption breaks into our plans. Number five. Our detailed plans may not always be God's plans, although they may be in tune with the big plan. Paul's detailed plans were, well, I'm going to go through from here, through Macedonia and Achaia, and I'm going to go back to Jerusalem, and then I'm going to go and make a trip to Rome. And Paul had it all laid out. I mean, he was an organized kind of guy. Paul, I like Paul for being organized. I like to be organized. I hate disorganization. I hate clutter. I hate things that are messy. You know, I hate it when somebody takes something from one place and I go looking for it and I can't find it and I have to hunt for two hours before I find it and they've left it some other place they didn't put it back where it belongs. It drives me nuts. Paul was an organized guy. He had it all detailed, but you know what? It was in harmony with God's big plan. God was going to get Paul to Rome, but God may do it a different way. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The next lesson we learn, number six, one, two, three, four, five, six, yes, number six, be proactive in your service for God. Be proactive in your service for God. Ask yourself the question, what does God want me to do 
next? Not next meaning three years from now. What does God want me to do next? I got tomorrow that I'm looking forward to. Now, right now, as far as I know, there are certain next things that I got to do plunk, 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 within the next 24 hours. Because the Lord willing, 24 hours from now, will be sort of toward the end of a trustee meeting. And I have a report to type that's 8 to 16 pages long every month. So I look at that and I say, clock is ticking, you know, got to get that done. I was up till 2 a.m. last night trying to finish this paper that I got to present down in Texas this week. And uh, got everything done. And then today, another thought hit me and I thought, that has to go in the paper. <laughs> so even though I printed it out 55 pages long last night, I'm going to have to go back and add some stuff to it. Oh, my. And I got to do that before Tuesday morning. Because Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock, I'm driving out of here, the Lord willing, and going to the airport and flying to Texas. So, you know, we have these detailed plans. God may interrupt that. God may let me die tonight of a heart attack. You know, God may, I hope it doesn't happen because Paul's going to be taking me to the airport, uh, but we may have a, a wreck on the way to the airport or a flat tire or, you know, a breakdown of the car or who knows what. Or I may get on the plane and it gets... Uh, uh, turned in heading out to Iran or something like that by a bunch of terrorists. I mean, we don't know what God is going to do. We make our plans. But we need to be flexible and let God determine the plans. He may actually be planning on getting us to the big plan, which was sort of in line with the end of our big plan, but he may change the direction on the way. So be proactive. Ask, what does God want me to do next? But be ready when he changes the tack of your sails. By the way, that's a very good question. What does God want me to do next? That's a very good question for children to ask when they really want to please their parents. Those of you who are parents, wouldn't it delight you if um, when your children did what you told them to do, you told them, I want you to wash the dishes that when they're done with the dishes, they didn't immediately try to evade you and run out in the yard and play, but instead they came up to you and said, Dad or Mom, what would you like me to do next? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Man, I tell you, I look back over all the years of raising kids and I think to myself, well, there were a few times I can remember when my kids did that, but that's really a good question. What do you want me to do next? You go to your authority and say, what would you like me to do next? I'm ready to serve. That's great for children to ask their parents. It's a good question for an employee to ask who really wants to please his or her boss. Most of us, you know, the boss gives us an assignment. We think, oh, no, not that again. I hate doing that particular part of this job. And we do it, and then we sort of, you know, we drag our feet so that because we know that the next thing that happens after that part of the job is this part, which we really, really don't like. What would it be like I mean, do you think it would surprise your boss if you got it done in an expert manner, you did it quickly, and then you immediately went to his cubicle or found him someplace else out on the floor or wherever he is, and you said, hey, I got it done. What would you like me to do next? And you said it with some enthusiasm. He'd have a heart attack. He'd drop over. <laughs> He'd fall under his desk right into the trash can. It's a good question to ask. It's a good question for a church member to ask who wants to see the work of the local church flourish. Hey, what can I do next to be a blessing to this church? That'd be a surprise for the pastor and the elders. <laughs> what can I do next? You know, please give me an assignment. Uh, you know, we'd have to scramble to think about it because most of the time it's like, oh man, there's so much to do around here. Got to categorize it, think about it. You know, what what do we do next? What a way to bring joy to the pastor's heart and the elders' hearts. What would you like me to do next? You know, Paul was that kind of a guy. It's a good question for you to ask about every open time slot in the day. Instead of saying, man, I think I'll kick back my heels and waste some time. You're not wasting time. You're wasting your life. You have only a certain amount of time that God has given to you. There is a cutoff point. None of us know when it is. So the question becomes, and I think this is the way Paul thought, this is what we see going on in this passage. Paul was always thinking, what do I do next? How can I use this next little fragment of time? When, for example, you fly, do you, do you always carry a Bible with you? Do you carry tracks with you? 
you have opportunities, you will have opportunities to sit next to someone and witness to them. I try to always carry tracks when I go. When I went on that trip last spring, I had several hundred tracks with me and Gospels of John and portions of Scripture. And when I got there, I found there was another couple that was ready for witnessing too. And they had they had actually bought a whole bunch of New Testaments with little help things in the back. And they gave me 30 or 40 of those. And I had the opportunity instead of going scuba diving and all the other stuff that people were doing, I had the opportunity of actually talking to people about Christ. And by the time I finished the trip on my last flight back, I was out of tracks. And I sat down next to a young woman, and, you know, I normally don't talk to young women if I don't know them. And um, But she offered me her cookies, and it opened up a conversation. And it turned out she was a Muslim, I shared Christ with her. And I think I shared that exciting adventure with you, how right at the point when I asked her, you know, if you died tonight, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And just as she was about to answer, we were coming in for landing. The plane was almost on the runway. You could see the lights on. You could see the runway below. The pilot zoomed up. Steep bank, 45 degrees going up. He banked suddenly to the right. People were screaming all over the plane. How God can put a point on the question. If you were to die tonight, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. She didn't want to profess a faith in Christ that evening, but I had at least one business card and I wrote our web address on the back of it said you might want to go here and listen sometimes maybe she's listening tonight I hope she is there's a real God out there there's a real God out there he loves you he died for you that's why Christ came into the world he paid for your sins he was buried and rose again trust him and you have eternal life are you always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that lieth within you with meekness and fear you are commanded, it's not a suggestion, it's a command, to be ready. Paul was ready. Paul used every minute of his time. I remember sitting in an airport in another place and was sitting down next to an older woman. woman. We were waiting for the, our flight and we started a conversation. And I had the opportunity of sharing the Gospel of John with her, talking to her about her children and grandchildren and how she was so worried about them and how the real answers are in God's Word. Do you use every minute of your time? When you waste time, you're wasting your life. The most precious thing that God has given to you is not your money, it's not your house, it's not your car, it's not the junk you've collected over however long you've lived. The most precious thing you have is your time. How are you using it? Are you planning for it? That's what we see going on here. And then with prayer, direction from the Word of God, wise counsel, move forward. But always be ready to let God alter your course and your direction. That's what's taking place in our text. Number seven, lesson number seven in the text tonight. Think big. Think big. We serve a big God. Paul had planned to set up a mission base in the capital of the empire. Rome was the center of the ancient world. What better place to expand the mission base so that the gospel would go everywhere? What he didn't know was that God was going to give him a free ticket to do it. In fact, God was going to give him a military guard to get him there so he didn't have to worry about Jewish and pagan opposition. He didn't have to worry about assassins. He didn't have to worry about mob riots. Plus, and this is what was so exciting, God was going to throw in a nice rental house for two years when he got there, apparently at government expense because he was a government prisoner. But it was his own hired house. He had a whole house where he could get people come in and go out. I mean, God set Paul up with a mission base in Rome. Now, that's what Paul had planned to do, but Paul had sort of worked out a different detail. But God said, look, Paul, i got a better plan for you. In fact, you're going to get to witness to a bunch of people along the way. Uh, you're going to have this incredible uh, voyage on a ship and there's going to be a shipwreck, 
and you're going to have the opportunity in that shipwreck to, to save 218 people and then you're going to get cast on an island and when you get cast on that island you're going to have the opportunity of healing this guy and uh, and you're going to lead his son to Christ who's the governor of the island uh, you're going to have the opportunity of witnessing to people that otherwise you would never have had the opportunity to witness to you know when God changes the course of our lives and our directions it's always for a purpose you know I hadn't planned to be on that plane that I flew back on and got seated next to a Muslim girl it was the last seat on the plane I was flying standby I had already been bumped from two or three other flights throughout that day as I was waiting coming from Florida back to Philadelphia because God had one specific seat that he wanted me to sit in when God changes your plans do you get all bent out of shape when God doesn't let you do something you wanted to do and you end up doing something you really didn't want to do do you thank him for it you see that's the kind of details that we see going on here in our passage tonight we serve a big God when we think that bad things are happening we need to get Paul's perspective things are really good remember Paul was on his way to Rome listen to what he wrote to the church at Rome in our passage Paul's hoping to get to Rome which he does by the end of the book but listen to what he wrote to the church at Rome Romans 8 verses 26 and following likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought now do you think Paul spent time in prayer how many of you think Paul spent time in prayer are we awake out here <laughs> okay yes I think Paul spent time in prayer but Paul says we know not what we should pray for as we ought why because we're not God we don't see the future we don't know anything except what God's Word tells us is going to happen in the future but we don't know the details we don't know the precise timing of it we don't know how we're going to be involved in it we pray and we seek by the grace of God through the study of God's Word to pray in harmony with the Word of God but we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered which by the way that is not speaking about tongues because it's groanings which cannot be uttered people who speak in tongues are uttering it okay he's talking about what the Holy Spirit does what you and I can't do as the Holy Spirit intercedes for us before the throne of God and he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the Saints according to the will of God the Spirit knows the perfect will of God for your life even when you and I don't even when we're walking in fellowship we don't always know the perfect will of God though we want to be in it we don't know exactly what it is the details of it but the Spirit does and then verse 28 here's Paul's perspective when the bad things happened and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that's God's goal for you that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified whom he justified them he also glorified <laughs> and here's Paul's wonderful conclusion what shall we say then to these things if God be for us who can be against us that's the attitude that Paul had when the mob riot came and he was ready to go in and stand in front of the mob because he f probably figured hey this is wonderful I'm gonna get to preach to this giant crowd of people now the guy that got up there was a Jew and so they wouldn't let him talk Alexander if Paul had gotten up there they wouldn't want to let Paul talk either but then Demetrius and the silversmiths would have had a precise target the guy that got up they didn't have anything against him it's just the crowd sort of went wild God kept him out God didn't let him witness to that particular crowd God instead had a different plan for Paul and so Paul says what should we say to these things if God be for us who can be against us he didn't worry about the crowds he didn't worry about the assassins he didn't worry about the mobs he didn't worry about the opposition if God be for us who can be against us because Paul was walking by faith every minute of every day Paul was seeking to fill every opportunity every slot of time with something that would be beneficial for eternity 
Not merely profitable for time. Beneficial for eternity. Is that how we view our jobs? Is that how we view our time? Is that how we view our families? Is that how we view our resources? Is that how we view our opportunities at church or opportunities at witness or opportunities at work? The next thing that we learn from the passage in Acts 19 is that Paul had men who were willing to actively work with him to accomplish the goals that God had set before him. Paul was not on his own. God gave him men who stood with him and who were willing to work. Not just willing to sort of be there, to have a little of that aura of the Apostle Paul rub off on them, and they could say, I'm a traveling companion to Paul. Man, is it cool. You know, why? while we get to sit around in the evenings and, and just sort of have these theological discussions, and, oh man, I'm just soaking it in. There are a lot of people out there like that, the hanger-ons type. These were men who worked. These were men who said, you know, God has led Paul and he has clearly gifted Paul and we want to be a part of the work. Timotheus and Aristarchus are the two who are mentioned here in the passage. Actively worked to accomplish the goals that God set before him. Paul kept those who were working with him busy with profitable work. Now, did you notice what it said about them? They were there ministering to Paul. So he sent into Macedonia the two of them that ministered unto him. In other words, Paul is giving up personal benefits here. He didn't just keep them around for his own personal benefit. He would rather see them exercising their gifts for outreach instead of having them take care of his own personal errands. He was willing to release his support group, if you will, when in fact he was on the brink of needing them the most. Look at the first word of verse 22. After all this stuff has been taking place, it says, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him. Because Paul said, I'm going to have to go through, you know, Macedonia and Achaia, and I'm going to get back to Jerusalem, then I'm going to go to Jerusalem, uh, I'm going to go to Rome after that. You'd think, well, you need everybody with you at this point. You need to have the team together. But it was because of those things and Paul realized that there were some other needs that needed to be taken care of. It says, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him. Timotheus and Erastus. That's a big word in the context. Because he had all the plans of verse 21, he was strategizing about the best use of the ministry team so that all the bases would be covered in his absence. How important that is. People usually don't care if you're ignored when you preach the gospel as long as it doesn't get affecting them personally. But if you preach, if your preaching suddenly means that people are getting converted, and especially if it's hurting somebody economically, people get very upset. Verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. There are two phrases in those verses. Did you catch it? brought no small gain unto the craftsman. Notice it brought a lot of money. That's verse 24. And then when he's talking, he says, by this craft we have our wealth. What was his first and primary focus? M-O-N-E-Y. Money! You know, that's the principal focus of most people in the world today. That is the principal focus of a lot of Christians, too. Let me give you an example, an illustration. There are men, including some in higher levels of employment in their companies, and I've known some of these folks, who've tried to have a Christian testimony at work. Ever had to try tried to have a Christian testimony at work? In some cases, they've witnessed to fellow employees. Perhaps they've encouraged other employees not to lie for a supervisor. I have a situation, one that I could tell you about. I won't. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but uh, where a, an employee was told to lie for the supervisor, and that employee said, I will not do it, and got fired. Or perhaps they've put out tracks in the customer area. Or perhaps they've spoken to customers about Christ. Perhaps they've taken a stand for moral righteousness that has resulted in negative customer feedback. And all of a sudden, their supervisor is down their throat about keeping their private religion out of the workplace. Ever heard that? Ever run into some vibes along that line? Perhaps as a result of their witness, they've been passed over for a promotion or had a pay cut or been demoted inside the company structure. Perhaps they've even been fired. Folks, is that really a shock? 
Do we really believe that the proof of doing right is the avoidance of persecution and suffering? Some people think that's the goal. They think, man, if I do right, you know, the, the results, the, the right results to get is I'll avoid persecution and suffering. What if the opposition is organized and powerful and vocal and vicious and aggressive, which is what we've got in our text tonight? These guys were. They were organized. It was a union. They were powerful. They were vocal. They were vicious. They were aggressive. Does that mean that we should shut up and go away? Does it? I think not. You see, as far as the company is concerned, so-called company, there are areas of your life that you have to keep out of the workplace because it affects the bottom line. That's what's going on. It's affecting their bottom line. But is that God's instruction to the Christian? Can you really isolate your Christianity into a soundproof box 40 hours per week? Can you? Are you really supposed to keep your mouth shut if you're at a social event, for example, and run into a customer? Even if the customer gives veiled threats to your employer that he didn't appreciate you talking about religion, even though it wasn't in company time. Suppose he tells you that he plans to take his business elsewhere if you keep talking to him about religion. Suppose he threatens to actually get other people together to raise a boycott and try to shut you down and ruin you economically. I hope you understand that that's exactly what the homosexuals are doing right now to Christian businessmen all over the United States today. A lot of lawsuits going on on that, folks. So should we just fold up our tents and sink quickly into the mud to avoid a lawsuit and the loss of money? You see, there's some practical lessons about what's going on here. It cuts both ways. It's not just the bad guys who have this inordinate desire for money. But we want our security. We want our stability. We want our bank accounts. And if our employer tells us we can't talk about Christ or we might just be the next one to go, do we shut up? Would Paul have shut up, do you think? Do you think Paul would have shut up? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, after all, I've, I've written that stuff about, you know, being in, in submission to those in authority over you. They are intermediate authorities, people. What commission has Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, given to you? What commission has Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, given to you? You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, except for the 40 hours a week that you're at work. Or in their case, back in those days, about 80 hours a week. What did Jesus Christ tell you to do? Remember, greed is the root of all evil. Paul writes that to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. <coughs> but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, it's certain we can carry nothing out, so hey, who cares how much you've got? With food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, ooh, that draw, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money, that's covetousness, that's greed, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, you know what it makes you do? They have erred from the faith. Well, the boss said, I can't, I can't witness to the customers anymore, even if they ask me questions. Even if they see that there's a Bible on my desk, the boss has told me I can't have a Bible at work. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know what you're doing? You're stabbing yourself. When you choose to obey an intermediate authority in disobedience to the higher authority. I know it's uncomfortable for me to talk about this stuff, isn't it? Well, that's what's going on in the text tonight, and Paul wasn't scared of it. 
But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Paul knew he was in warfare. It's all the way through the book of Acts. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Grab it. For unto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Timothy, remember, was one of the two who was sent by Paul at this time from Ephesus. He was going out as a young man. Well, he had a traveling companion with him. He wasn't all alone, but, but the big lion was not there with him, Paul. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this uh, suggestion. <laughs> keep this suggestion, right? That's not what it says. What is the word that is there? Keep this commandment. Not keep this suggestion or keep this good idea sort of tucked away in a drawer in case you might want to use it sometime when it's not too threatening without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this commandment lasts all the way to the rapture. And remember that covetousness is idolatry, which, <laughs> you know, that's our context tonight. These are guys who are building silver shrines to Diana. They're in the business of idolatry. <laughs> but Paul doesn't write this to Demetrius. Paul writes this to the church. Oh, at, at what time? Where was Paul located at this point? Ephesus. Ephesus. That's what Paul wrote to Ephesus after the riot over the idol-worshipping shrines of Diana. Paul knew this was a problem in the church, not just a problem with Demetrius and the silversmiths. For you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. You guys there at Ephesus, you think you're so pious and so holy? Because, man, you've never bought one of those shrines to Diana. You're not about to support that liquor business or that prostitution center or that particular activity. No, but they had idolatry in the church because they had covetousness. Nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, that includes covetousness. There's whoremongers, unclean persons. <laughs> Remember we talked about unclean demons. Covetous people. Three are listed there. Let no man deceive you, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. He says the same thing over in Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Mortify, that is, put to death. If therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, pretty bad, uncleanness, there we got it again, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, all of those things are the idea of getting something for yourself and covetousness which is idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience Paul is being rather blunt I'm sure that there were people there at, at the church in, in Ephesus that when they walked by the place where shrines were being sold they probably walked on the other side of the street and stuck their nose up and Maybe even sneered or glared at the proprietor or pointed a finger at him, shook their heads. Bad. I can remember when our kids were little. That's what they would do. You know, some child disobeyed something we had told them, and the other kids would back off and say, Bad. <laughs> oh, dear people. Be careful. When you point one finger one direction, you got three pointing back at yourself. The problem was in the church. That's really what our passage is about tonight, the loss of money, covetousness and greed. We criticize Demetrius and his crew, and we criticize pagan employers for being focused on the almighty dollar. 
but the principle applies to us as well. Does our greed for money make us into deaf mutes while we're at the work? Is our job so important that we're not willing to walk by faith and certainly not to talk about Jesus? Are we so afraid of our annual evaluation re recording a negative that might affect a future job that we might apply for, that in the process we deny Christ? Suppose your boss is a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu or an evolutionary atheist. Does God really expect you to keep the gospel in a box as you interact with people all day long? Is the gospel, or is it not, woven into every sinew and fabric of your being? Have you or have you not been sent to proclaim the gospel everywhere, including at work? Is Jesus Lord only part of the day, or is he Lord all day long, including your hours at work? You say, well... <laughs> I live like a Christian every day at work. I live like a Christian. Great. That's like giving the same kind of smelly, mushy answer that you believe in God. Well, remember, so does the devil and he trembles. Who cares if you think you are living like a Christian at work? Now, that's obviously better than living like a drunken, murderous, adulterous, degenerate, bitter, lying, hateful thief at work. <laughs> yeah, no question about that. But Jesus lived a better life than you do, and even he was forced to open his mouth so that people would understand why he was doing it. How do you keep from being ashamed from vocally witnessing at work? Here's what Paul said. First, Paul understood what the gospel could do. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed. Are you ashamed of witnessing at work? Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul understood what the gospel could do. That's the reason he was not ashamed. Second, Paul was motivated by hope and love. Love for the lost and hope that some would believe. You know, if you never witness, it's convincing proof that you have no love for the lost. It's convincing proof that you have no real hope that any of them will ever be saved. Romans 5.5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Paul was motivated by hope and love. Usually our motivation is that we don't want to suffer. We don't want to lose any money, all that good stuff, you know, that's out there for the grabbing. Peter has something to say about that, because Peter understood that suffering is proof that you have a real Christian testimony. 1 Peter 4, 12 and following. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Paul knew it wasn't strange. Remember we talked about his approach in Romans uh, chapter 8. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, why are you passing out those tracts about Jesus? Why are you talking to employees about their salvation? If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Normally when we suffer, it's because of one of those things. We're not really living the Christian life the way we're supposed to live the Christian life. Yet, verse 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Our time's up tonight. There's so much more here. I've got... How do you keep from being ashamed of the gospel of Christ? There are three rules. Did you know there are three rules for how to keep from being ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Did you know there's a difference between false shame and real shame? And i got verses on each one of these things here. Did you know that someday God is going to be ashamed of some of his children and that he will not be ashamed of the rest? Do you want to fall into the category where he's ashamed of you? Or do you want to fall into the category of where he's pleased with you and not ashamed of you? The real question to ask, what would Jesus do or expect me to do in this situation? After all, you are going to give him an account someday. Or, 
you're going to have to shamefully say, I didn't do it. But how you handled yourself. Now, wisdom and courtesy and kindness is always required. We have not been called to be obnoxious for Jesus. That's not what God called you to do. I want to be an obnoxious wretch for Jesus. There aren't any hymns in the hymn book like that. I hope not. But we have been called upon to always communicate the truth in every setting of life. And that's, of course, what Paul is doing at Ephesus. Well, I'm going to stop there because there's a lot of material here that's really important. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the truth of the gospel and that you've called us to be witnesses 168 hours a week. We must live for Christ, and that means we must speak for Christ. That's part of living for Jesus in all that I do. Help us, Father, day by day to live in such a way that He will not be ashamed of us because we are not ashamed of Him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 496.